I just got back from an aircraft carrier in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. We were shooting some VR there. So if I get close to you and I smell like jet fuel, um, let me know. But uh, distribution is very important in virtual reality because it's so scant right now. And even if you have to go out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean to distribute your stories, um, sometimes that's important. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So we launched a VR app not too long ago. Uh, you can see our content on Gear VR, iOS, Android, all the virtual reality apps, but I want to talk today uh, just for a few minutes um, about specifically some of the lessons that we learned from launching these VR apps and perhaps some mistakes uh, that we made that you all don't have to make as well. So this is the ecosystem right now. We've got the devices, we've got the controllers, we have the developer tools, the camera mapping, the content, the social content, educational, medical, and business enterprise. What category is missing there? Journalism, right? <laughs> Journalism is really not on uh, the map for a lot of um, virtual reality industry right now. Uh, matter of fact, when you go to submit a VR app, one of the things that we learned was that they're like, what? Journalism? There isn't even a category for it, um, specifically on the Oculus Gear VR platform. You have to file it under educational. And then they come back and say, well, these are kind of like stories. We really don't think it's, is it educational? It's like, well, no, but you don't have a category for journalism. So um, that's one of the things that I know Journalism 360 and others are trying to educate some of those um, industry leaders that VR journalism is a thing and it should have a separate category because it's not a first person shooter game. It's not a medical um, device. It's not a controller. It's not anything else. It needs its own uh, specific set category for VR journalism. So consumer spending on VR entertainment, VR content, if you will, and we are a content creator, it will hit $3.3 billion in 2020, and that depends on which statistic it changes daily, who you go to, but um, that's about an average that they're talking about how much consumers are spending on virtual reality content, $3.3 billion by 2020. And so what we're seeing is a rise of immersive media networks, uh, just like in the early days of television where people were would tag their business with TV, you are seeing entities tag their companies with VR. The New York Times, uh, Daily 360, doing some great work with Michelle, uh, Marcel Hopkins there. Uh, Condé Nast, Vice Media, Discovery Communications, HBO, they invested in Otoy, which is a virtual reality company. Disney invested in Jaunt, which is a virtual reality content and camera company. And Comcast, um, invested in Next VR, which uh, is doing some pioneering work as far as live VR. So a rise of these immersive media networks and a rise really of immersive media broadcasting. It used to be that we are still in the live streaming stage of uh, social media and communication. People are doing uh, Periscope, uh, Facebook Live and Facebook 360 Live. And now their next iteration of that is um, where people are stepping inside these virtual reality platforms and they're sharing their content. Content. So VR companies aren't just creating recorded content, um, they're actually having um, broadcast towers inside some of these immersive media spaces with which to distribute them. So for instance, uh, this is a particular uh, space called Altspace VR. Has anybody ever been in Altspace? It's, it's, yeah, a, a, a neat space where you can interact with other individuals and environment and you can consume content together, just as if we were in this room consuming content together. So you see individuals um, gathered here in a variety of different avatars and they're watching the, de the debates uh, between Trump and Clinton and they're having a dialogue, a face-to-face -face dialogue uh, with individuals about that particular debate. Um, and that was fascinating to watch. Not too long ago, I was on top of a volcano um, in, in VR and alt space and we are watching a documentary about somebody um, who captured this particular volcano and we're not watching it through the filter of a fixed rectangle we're actually on the volcano you know looking all the way around with other people and um, getting content so immersive broadcasting and the rise of immersive broadcasting VR chat is another place where individuals are going to go to consume content and another place media companies are going with which to disseminate their content as well there are already comedy clubs there people are gathering around the campfire and sharing stories um, people are going in there to get therapy 
all the kinds of things out there that you would do in regular real life, individuals are going into these virtual reality um, spaces to consume that kind of content. So CNN, uh, another media company that has VR on the end of it now on one of its particular sections, and you can not only uh, consume CNN's content uh, on a mobile device or in a headset, and a lot of what I'm talking about right now isn't necessarily in a headset. As we know, virtual reality content does not need a headset to be consumed. Uh, you can also repurpose that content in a web VR version, and by that web VR version, I mean uh, a 360 degree media uh, that is consumed in the browser and you have the ability to scroll that media all the way around. So the majority of our content right now at StoryUp uh, isn't consumed in a headset, it's consumed in a browser where people can go to Facebook 360, YouTube 360, or web VR um, on our site and consume those particular media experiences. And 360 video, web VR, content viewed within the browser is the gateway drug to then eventually consuming it in the headset. Um, but when I talk about VR, I actually mean, uh, in addition to what's consumed in a headset, the ability to repurpose that content where the eyeballs are right now in a web VR experience. So this is the Wall Street Journal app um, as well. Again, companies creating this content inside immersive media uh, spaces and and they're creating websites that you step into. Uh, you know, uh, websites are no longer flat. They can be immersive media experiences. Huffington Post purchased Riot, a virtual reality company doing some pioneering work with 360 degree video. Our apps um, are out right now on uh, Samsung Gear VR. Uh, they'll also be here this week. I hopefully, um, on iOS, uh, Android, and then uh, PlayStation, Google Daydream, Oculus Rift, and HTC Vive after that. And the content that we do, variety of content. We're one part journalism studio and one part brand studio. Our brand studio obviously supports our journalism but we're also creating content that is media therapy, and I'll talk about that coming up in just a moment. So the very first lesson that we learned from deploying these virtual reality apps is that VR app development takes a heck of a lot longer than flat apps. Um, we thought it would take about four months in order to put it together, but in reality, it's taken about eight. And the reason for that isn't necessarily you know, uh, the company that's doing our development, they're doing great work. It's the fact that each one of these videos for each one of these platforms requires a different bit rate, different frames per second, different resolution. So you have all of this half a dozen uh, different VR platforms with which you have to resize every single story. And there aren't necessarily standards out there um, that work uh, because it depends on which kind of phone you have. So you really play this hunt and peck game of trying to guess uh, you know, what kind of phone individuals will be viewing your content on and then how to adjust that bit rate and things accordingly. So that's why VR um, app development takes a long time because sometimes it takes a long time for content creators in order to get all of those different resolutions in order to create it. So this is a look um, at, at the millions of headsets that have been sold and the landscape really for the VR distribution platforms that are out there. Uh, Samsung Gear VR, Google Cardboard obviously is where our, all of the eyeballs are and 98% of headsets sold right now are for mobile homes, or mobile, mobile phones. So uh, with that, Obviously, that is one of the areas where a lot of VR companies are paying particular attention. Not everyone has an HTC Vive or an Oculus Rift uh, or, or room scale VR um, in order to consume this content. So most uh, VR companies are put, placing their bets on cardboard and gear VR and Daydream because Daydream is a mobile VR device. Uh, and then eventually coming to the, all of those um, other platforms. But that's a very important statistic because right now that's where the eyeballs are. We don't know what Apple's going to do, uh, rumors that the um, iPhone 8 will come out with dual cameras, which makes, uh, you know, that'll be some fascinating UGC content if individuals have the ability to capture 360 degree video, you know, natively from, from their camera, and also flexible electronics. Uh, what will the flexible electronics industry do that will enable us to have something that doesn't look like a brick cell phone on our face? 
So we're all watching that as well. But primarily Gear VR, Oculus Rift, HTC Vive, and then the Sony PlayStation. And just by a show of hands, um, how many of you guys have uh, tr have a Google Cardboard or have tried a Google Cardboard device? Okay, so all, all of the hands. Um, how about beyond that? Um, is there anybody in this room who owns a Rift or a Vive? Yeah. So, you know, obviously penetration for these devices is, is um, you know, slowly but surely coming up um, as we go. And so that's why we as content creators are focused on those Google Cardboard and Samsung Gear VR, Google Daydream devices, because that's where the majority of people have the ability to access that, that, that content of those hands that went up. Uh, lesson number two we learned, be careful building your house in someone else's castle. So there are a lot of, um, software companies out there that are touting features that allow you to upload once uh, your, your, your VR content or your immersive stories, and then they will repurpose it on all of the different platforms for you, right? Uh, that way you don't have to create native apps for all of those half a dozen different um, platforms because VR is, is, the distribution is really broken right now. But be careful with that because a lot of those companies um, are no longer around when they first started. And if you build up uh, that house in, in that castle um, and it comes crumbling down, you don't have the ability to get that content back. Um, you know, we saw that with VR video. Um, they closed up shot not, not too long ago. So just be very, very careful about where you share your content and where you choose to distribute your content. The third lesson that we learned was that VR has been shown just as effective as a moderate dose of hydromorphodone, that is a powerful painkiller. And why am I mentioning that? Um, because with immersive media, it's as if people aren't just watching the content, they're actually feeling it. That particular statistic comes from studies at the University of Washington. So part of the things that we do at StoryUp um, and the way we distribute our content is peer-to-peer. -peer. So we go out into these, these veterans' homes and assisted living centers um, because those are the majority of the places that, that consume our content, and we share these with individuals who aren't able to physically travel. So this particular gentleman, we went into his um, place of residence, and his caretaker told us uh, he probably won't be able to, you know, turn his head very much. He can't really raise his arms or legs um, because he's he's so weak on on oxygen and he has cancer. Uh, after watching some of these stories, you can see his hands are up in the air. He is reaching out to touch the people that he sees inside his headset. So we see this with the, with the content that we produce. You know, research from a variety of places is showing that uh, VR has a very therapeutic tool and that you're not just watching the video, you're actually feeling it. And the reason why I mention this for distribution is the fact that healthcare institutions will be large distributors of VR content, and they already are. Distraction therapy, um, distraction media therapy is a real thing. So for instance, when you're undergoing a blood draw or a painful procedure, you can put a virtual reality headset on and watch these immersive stories, and you have the ability to escape and the, the ability to go someplace else. And research, not from us, um, but from other entities, have shown that there is a reduction in pain when they are viewing this particular kind of media. So. Uh, one of the things that we do at uh, Story Up are looking specifically at how your brain reacts to virtual reality story and nonfiction storytelling in some of those environments. And on our app, you'll see a variety of these experiences, not just journalism, uh, you'll see mindfulness experiences, you'll see experiences about empathy, experiences about motivation as well. And we actually studied what VR does to the brain. So we partnered with the Neuromeditation Institute in Oregon, and they create video games in order to treat uh, baseline symptoms of depression and anxiety. And uh, they study the, study the brain, and they're creating these flat video games. So. Um, we, we came to them, they came to us, and, and um, together they said, is there any way that what you're doing um, can be used to tailor the brain in, in a certain way in order to make people uh, feel a, a certain way? 
So we decided to, to study, I'm a journalist, a, a naturally skeptical one, you know, what is different about flat V media versus immersive media? And you're looking at the gamma activity of, of the brain. So the gamma activity of the brain before a virtual reality experience, and then the gamma activity of the brain after a virtual reality experience as measured by EEG. There's a significant difference. Um, what we don't know is the fact, is this reproducible, and how long does it last? Um, but we're seeking additional funding in order to get some of those uh, answers because we feel, at least from the thousands that we've given um, virtual reality to, that it has, does have a therapeutic effect on these individuals. Uh, same with empathy. Uh, a lot of times VR creators roll their eyes when you know they talk about VR being an empathy machine. It's such an overused term in virtual reality. But science actually shows that the anterior cingulate, which is an empathy emotional processing center of the brain, lights up when individuals are viewing some of these stories. So this, these three particular case studies were done by the Neurometation Institute uh, with our content uh, from Story Up, and you can see more and do a deep dive into them if you go to medium.com slash Sarah stories on there. You can read more about it. So because VR is an empathy machine, we're seeing more and more charities and foundations become distribution networks for virtual reality because they have the ability to allow people to step inside their stories, create a sense of empathy in that, and hopes that individuals contrib will contribute more to their causes. So uh, there's actually research out there that shows that uh, donations increase by multiples when you show an individual a virtual reality experience and you can actually put them in Africa um, or whatever. We've done stories all over the world uh, this last year in Eastern Congo, in Zambia, um, in the, the Amazon, we were in Dubai not too long ago, um, and capturing stories some of them for, for foundations. Um, Empowered by Light wants to allow individuals to feel what it's like um, not to have solar energy, to, be, to live in the dark. We can do that in VR. And you know, the reason why they are hiring individuals to do that is because they're wanting to create that sense of empathy. So distribution networks, definitely for charities and foundations, they're distributing their content. And especially with uh, individuals, you know, for instance, the, the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation, who have big, large distribution networks, that's a network. When uh, people can share your content on, on their social media um, platforms, that's really helpful to pair up with some of those larger en entities. The bulk of the way that we are seeing virtual reality distributed is peer-to-peer. -peer. People will pass it around a room, right? Look at this, have you seen this? Uh, they won't even strap it on their face, they'll just, just pa pass it around a room. And also with mailing addresses. So anybody who has a mailing address has the ability to distribute virtual reality content. We saw that with, with the New York Times, a UPS could be a VR distributor. FedEx could be a VR, VR distributor. Mary Kay Cosmetics. Stitch Fix, um, you know, any of those have the ability to um, send content to their individuals. We've learned that VR is stickier, or 360 video web VR, uh, 360 video viewed in the browsers are, is, is stickier than regular flat video. Uh, these case studies are on our blog as well. An increase in, in video views, an increase in the click-through rate, some individuals call it the gaze-through rate in a headset. Um, it increased the, not only video views, but it also decreased the CPM or the cost per impression. So the advertising dollars went longer with immersive media video. I want to draw attention to uh, this. This is our website, and it has a web VR component on it on our website at storyup.com. You can drag the video um, you know, all the way around the screen in that particular video on a flat surface. And then uh, you know, someday when we have the ability to view these items in a headset, we'll be able to look all the way around, and you'll see our, our, our content um, in that. But this up at the very top, um, where it says stories and experiences, then you see a little um, VR headset device is a transition point. So uh, if you click that particular experience, 
here in the coming weeks, it will, right now it just takes you to our video gallery, but in the coming weeks it will take you to a web VR gallery. Um, and you know that to us is important because it represents a turning point between flat media um, and immersive media. It's a toggle switch, if you were, will. Um, think of it like a toggle switch for web VR, where your site can go from the flat world into the immersive world. And just as we had to make our websites responsive for mobile, so too will we have to make them responsive for VR because the world is becoming a place that you step into. And um, individuals aren't just going to want to view immersive content, they're going to want to view spherical content as well. So the last lesson that I'll leave you with is that VR isn't about reach, it's about depth. If you have somebody coming to you who, say, who says, I want to create a, a VR experience or you to tell a VR story because we're going to reach millions of people, you need to let them know that it's not about reach, it's about depth. It's about taking a smaller pool of people and being able to reach them on a deeper level, emotionally, cognitively, and um, perhaps uh, on a way that is more empathetic. Lastly, Journalism 360, if you go to Twitter on Journalism underscore 360, they are giving away $250,000 in grants to grow immersive journalism. So definitely check that out. Um, if you have questions about some of the content that might be allowed in that. This is not just for newsies. This is for technologists, developers, graphic designers, game designers, ethicists, anybody who has an idea who can grow immersive journalism. Def definitely check that out. We also have a Medium blog as well where you can apply, and that's a joint project between the Knight Foundation, Google News Lab, and the Online News Association.